afternoon. This is a rowdy crowd today. That's a good thing because these guys are all pretty rowdy. Everyone thinks that Randy's quiet, but he's not. Right? <laughs> all right. Well, I'm Susan Poche, with, um, along with my amazing team who put on the celebration of fine art and we are excited to bring you Contemporary Native Impressions, I think is what we titled this. And we're really going to speak about um, how these gentlemen have all been inspired by the Native traditions and uh, the joy that they bring to others. And we're going to have to really keep an eye on this one right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so right next to me is Randy Galloway, and Randy lives right here in Cape Creek, Arizona, grew up in New Mexico. Yeah, I was born in Carlsbad, New Mexico, and then grew up in Albuquerque. Beautiful, beautiful part of the country over there, for sure. And then uh, down the way there is Ray Tigerman, who currently resides down in Tubac. Tubac, Tubac, Arizona. Tubac, We think of it as two steps back. Literally. However, you grew up in... Yeah, I, I grew up in, uh, for the most part, Reno, Nevada, in the uh, Carterville, Carson City area, in proximity to a uh, Paiute Washington reservation when I was a kid. And, um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, we'll let Doug talk and then we'll let you like this. Yeah. Okay. And then Doug Fountain, who you kind of split your time between Colorado and Arizona. Perfect combination. Um, and Doug Fountain is beautiful works behind you with the totems and the the gourds with the feathers. So we're going to have a lot of fun finding out what motivates these guys and why they want to bring these beautiful traditions into all of our homes. So, um, Randy, I'd like to start with you. You you can tell us a little bit about your work and why you feel so compelled to share the Native stories. Well, uh, I grew up in New Mexico, and as a kid, uh, my dad liked going to the horse races, so he'd always bring me along, and I'd get dropped off at the curio shops, and uh, see all. And I just fell in love with uh, the graphics from the you know the Mexico tribes, and uh, loved all of that, and started getting into the Native American thing. Just uh, I was carving kachina dolls when I was a little kid, and I found out that they were carved with a uh, cottonwood root. So I went down into the uh, valley and, and cut up a cottonwood root out of the tree and, and let it dry and carved kachina out of that and, and uh, was really getting into it. And I built teepees and all this stuff. And so I was always drawn to it. And then uh, found out later, it was uh, 1979 when my grandmother died and so I would have been, you know, already out of college working, and then it filtered down through the family that it was in the back of her Bible that my great grandmother was Cherokee from Fannin County, Georgia, and uh, so then it was like, oh man, no wonder I'm into all this native stuff, you know? and, and so uh, I don't have a, a native card, so I can't say I'm a Native American artist. That's against the law, but. Um, I do have that, you know, kind of inspiration and was kind of drawn that way. And um, my great-grandmother, it turns out what it said in the Bible was that she died in childbirth on the third kid. And so that's where our whole family comes from because each one of those three kids had about ten. So then it just grew from there. And uh, nobody knows anything about it because it said she was born in 1867 and my great grandfather was born in 1841. So there's 26 years difference. So it said that uh, the first child was born in 1888. So she would have been 21 and she died at 25. And so since there's no information on it, except that she had her name in there as Sally Little. And I met a guy at an art show, a uh, Native American guy, and his last name was Little. So I was talking to him, told him the story, and I thought, well, maybe you can help me find out something about the Little thing. 
in Native American down in Georgia. And he just laughed and he said, no, 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 he said, she had an Indian name that nobody could pronounce. And everybody called the Native girls Little Sally. Said so then when it was written down, probably when she got married is Sally Little, rather than Little Sally. And he said, you'll, you'll never find out anything. He said, because uh, nobody kept any information on that. He said, your great grandfather could have been a rancher out there, lived out in the country, and he was so much older than her, he said, he could have won her in a gambling bet. And he said, or he could have bought her back then. You could buy her. And so, you know, the whole thing is bizarre. And so nobody knows anything. And since I'm Galloway, so it's Scotch-Irish, they were too proud. Nobody would ever admit that there was any native blood because that was the thing back then. And my, uh, my dad came from uh, West Virginia. They had moved up there because they would go wherever there were jobs back then. So there were steel mills. So they had moved from the south up north. So then the whole family was up in West Virginia. And they were way too proud to ever say we have any native blood. So it was hidden all this time in our family. So it's just one of those strange things. But, yeah, so these are my pieces over here. And uh, I did pretty much traditional uh, realism. And I was a commercial artist for years and years. I did illustration and graphic design and then changed over to doing some fine art. And the one thing I thought, well, something I can do that not many other people can do is super realism and so I went that way and then I started going to photo shoots with the Native Americans and taking all these great photos and you know, the beautiful outfits and totally fell in love with it because uh, my whole way of looking at it was that these were beautiful people and you know their concerns were beauty and nature and love and all the things that I was really into it you know it was, as far as I was concerned, white people were just boring as hell. So, you know, the names were super interesting. So it was a, a great thing to, to go into. We had plenty of uh, information. And uh, they had such a tumultuous life in the 1880s. So that's what I like doing is things from the 1880s. The whole big change of the white men coming in and all the problems of the Native Americans. I was going to say, lucky for us, you feel compelled to share the beautiful side of the story. And, you know, the... Yeah, my things are pretty much the, uh, the romantic side of their lives, rather than the, the old-fashioned kind of real dusty paintings that would, people would think of as Western art that are all kind of a, a muted palette and dusty, and they're all... Uh, shoot them up the Cowboys, Indians kind of thing and stagecoaches and all that. I look more towards their regular life and the beauty within the people, especially the, the faces, the beautiful people. And then I, you know, play off of that and try to do them as character portraits so they're the full character telling a story. Well, and we have a very vibrantly colorful collection behind us. All three of you have really brought it. Uh, through in, in the color to inspire us. So let's hear a little bit from you, Ray, about what was it that drew you to share the Native story? When I was young, I would take a root and I would make a kachina doll oh, and a yeah. and, Oh, no. Wait, wait. How do you follow that? How do you follow that? I would have, do you still have the I had a boring childhood compared to Randy's. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right, boring one. Yes, sir. Come on. Uh, yeah, well, so when I, when I was a kid, one of the things that we had in our family was we had an old journal. And one of my ancestors was a, uh, a Civil War soldier, uh, a Union soldier. And this journal was really fascinating for a number of reasons. Number one was the penmanship was amazing. And through this journal, he documented his, basically the expansion out west in like the 18, late 1860s, 1870s, 1890s. And uh, he ended up marrying a Cherokee, which was kind of unheard of at the time. And it, it was like one of those 
you know, probably similar, uh, you know, family dishonor, if you will. But this, this journal survived, and it was in our household. And growing up as a child, my my parents, they were inundated, and inundated me with, with South Coast art. One of my earliest images in my mind was uh, we had a Fritz shoulder. And it was uh, his very famous Indian on the Lake Shore 1977, I think. And it was, uh, it was just super impactful as a child. You have this very vibrant, very stylized image of a Native American. And shortly after, I remember this kind of indoctrination, we moved to the Carson City, Men and Gardenville area. And I had never seen a Native American before. And as a kid, we had moved to rural Nevada. And literally, you'd walk out my door across the street, and that's where the Paiute Indian Reservation was. And so all the white kids, they would go to another bus stop. I did not know this. So my first day of school, I showed up, and I remember like coming kind of, you know, like you're sitting there, and you're like, oh my god, who are those people? And they were just, they kind of materialized out of nowhere. And that was the first time I actually encountered uh, Native Americans, and I was shocked. And um, it was, uh, you know, an interesting situation to be in, in that environment. Um, yeah, and I was bullied. I I had a uh, I had a, a, a huge adjustment period, and I think because of that early childhood memory situation occurrence, whatever you would call it, it um, it kind of started my journey in trying to reconcile all these different elements in my uh, in my life. And what ultimately ended up happening is, even to this day, the majority of my childhood friends are all Native American. And I got a I got a great indoctrination. My buddy Tony, his uh, his uncle, his father, they were elders in the tribe. And as a kid, I, I was the white kid out on the reservation, lighting off fireworks, getting into trouble. Um, it was cool. And and I started, you know, you haven't I changed enjoyed much. It. it hasn't changed much. Yeah, yeah. I just my what some of my earliest uh, you know like journals are you know just drawing you know people on 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 horses. And, and playing with different color and shapes and things like that. So, uh, yeah, that's probably how, um, again, I had to follow Randy, you know. Um, but uh, that's kind of how my evolution as an artist started, was from those beginnings, that coloration, and it has continued on. Um, I went to school, having a formal education in art. I was an abstract painter uh, coming out of college, and one of the things that I would do for fun is I would do these little artistic statements, natives, horses, and things like that, and I would give them away as gifts. And one of those gifts ended up in Sedona, and there was a gallery in Sedona, the gallery in the Golden Sea, and she had seen one of those on her mantle, on her friend's mantle, and she was like, who is this? And that's kind of how they ultimately found me in, the, in Nashville, Tennessee. So yeah, kind of a an interesting story about how uh, how I started uh, depicting this subject with, with these colors. Yeah. Okay, we'll dive a little deeper in that in, in a that deep, round yes. deeper. But um, Doug Fountain is one of the when I first met Doug, I thought he was just kind of serious, and I didn't really. I think he was warm. I still feel that way. I will tell you. I mean, these guys are all fabulous, but Doug Fountain really embodies gratitude, humility, and the desire to just share the love of the journey. And I'm going to just hand it back to you to take it from there. Every, everybody needs to have a deep conversation with Doug because he's awesome. Uh, my journey with this is, you know, my mom was from the Spirit Lake Sioux Tribe in North Dakota. Uh, I have ancestors on 11 different reservations, and I, uh, I was fortunate enough I grew up in Florida, so I don't know a whole lot. But, you know, in my mom's day, it was like, get off the rest. Don't let anybody know you have. But as a kid, we would go visit my grandmother, all my yeah, mom's siblings, and I was always intrigued by the old timers and the stories they had. I was very fortunate to have met old timers that were around before reservations. 
So I was always more intrigued about what things meant. And uh, that's what drew me into my culture. So uh, I never realized how much I was into it until my grandmother came to live with us when I was in junior high. And then all her stories and everything, it's like, wow, she is way different, you know, than my other grandmother. And I, I just was really drawn to it. I, you know, didn't think much of it. I went to college in Colorado. Um, I was an architect. Um, at 29, I was in Santa Fe with friends. We were drinking tequila, and I'm like, wow, you know my Native American heritage? I have so much background in this. I could do this. And my friends are all like, go for it. Do it. And you know what I did? 27 years later, here I am. And I... It, it's a real spiritual journey for me because there are elements, you know, so much bad happened to my mom and her siblings and my grandmother and, and my ancestors, but I focused on what was really good and what was brought out in people, you know, the elements of, of what reaches your heart, the land, the spirit, that's what inspired me. I, I, I'm such an outdoor person and it, it, the Native Americans, my family was so connected with land and earth, and it, it's just who I am, and that's what got me into this, and I've just carried it on, so that's kind of simple, I don't really... I want to expand a little bit on Doug and his, let's just say, uh, his drinking thing that he brings up, is the right kind of thing? He's like, if you got clients, bring, bring some fun. wine, bring some wine, and I'm, that's why we get along. But. Something too I want to touch on, um, Doug and I were talking about this, um, Kind of framing the conversation also is why does this form and type of art have such an appeal? Because it does. It, it connects in a way that um, other art does, but in but in a kind of a deeper, meaningful way, in my opinion. And I think you know, in Arizona in particular, I think we have like 27 percent of Arizona is designated reservation land. It's the state in the union that has the most. Reservation and designation. There's 22 tribes in Arizona, um, and I think because of the connection with the land and the people, it's omnipresent. And I, you know, when I people ask me like, what type of Native Americans do you depict? And it's, uh, you know, it just depends. It's like I like that idea of the kind of the the stylized, the head, you know, more the plains Native Americans with the headdresses and the Indians, but other times it's the desert dwellers, it's the Pueblans, it's the Paiutes, it's the Washoe, it's some of these that are always uh, kind of motivating to me. But the reoccurring thing when I have conversations with, with uh, people, collectors, is that it's a reminder. It's a reminder of where we have been. It's a reminder of the type of people on some level that we still yearn to be, that connectivity to the land, that connectivity to our environment, that connectivity to uh, the other people, the energy. It's a reminder, a reminder of how things could be, what we strive to be. And then that's not to say that every culture doesn't have its inherent problems and challenges, but I think, uh, you know, I was just thinking about that, and I, and I think that's the strength, you know, what, what Randy does too, is he captures these quintessential moments, the TV that's backlit, the starry night, it's a connection between how they used to live outdoors, in the environment, self-reliant, you know, under the stars. Uh, I love that, I love that energy, I love that vibrancy. Doug, um, Doug and I, we're, is it 36 or 37 houses together? Yeah, we're like in a, yeah, pretty much when I walk into a collector's home, there's a good chance I'm gonna see Doug in there, literally, or his art. Um, <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> yeah, um, and I love Dove's work. Uh, in fact, um, we've each sold each other's work, which is really fun. And um, I love the fact that a lot of his totems, they have the Hopi eyes and the different shapes. And you know, and, and Doug has really um, increased my you know vernacular in certain tribes, which I appreciate too. But you know, it's the same thing. It's people can they can connect with it, they can resonate with it, and and it, it has a powerful message beyond. The awesomeness, let's just say awesomeness of the work, right? Um, yeah, anyway. You know, when I look at Randy's work and, and yours and mine, it, it's about what we bring of our feelings from that. 
I mean, it, it just, there's so much expression, so much good, so much happiness, and we overlook that. We tend to look at the Hollywood side of it. And um, it's more than that. It's your spirit. The Native Americans, it's about the land. It's about, you know, Father Sky, Mother Earth. And, and it's about bringing all those great elements. It's about your heart and, and living by that. And I think that's what's really wonderful about all of our work. I mean, it just it touches the soul. And that's what this is all about. It's about taking a different element of what is indigenous to here and bringing it into your heart, your home, your spirit, and, and making you feel wonderful every day. So that when you look at it, I just, you know, had a client last year in Dell. She's like, I've known your work for 30 years and I've never met you. She said, and she grabbed her heart when she talked to it. She said, I love it more today than the day of life. She said, it makes me happy. It makes me smile. It makes me feel really good. If I'm having a down day, I go in there. And that's what all of this does. I mean, race, the color. Color is such an important part of our life for healing, for feeling better. You know, I, you know that's why we do good on blue sky days as opposed to cloudy days. I mean, we have all of that in our work. And, and it's important to bring that in, into your life. And that's what I think all three of us really try to do with the Native American feel of it. It's like there's there's a part of the earth, there's a part of our spirit, a part of the sky, a part of all the elements. And that's what we're trying to capture with what we do. And that's what we enjoy living with as collectors, you know, to have that, that message. It's very good. Yeah, a lot of it might also be the, uh, the kind of need for simpler times. You know, that people kind of gravitate towards that, that this history and the Native Americans, the way they live, it's a lot simpler than our crazy lives now. And so right. people can, you know, see that and they can kind of feel that if they buy a piece and have it at home. And it kind of centers them and gives them that feeling every day. That's a really good point. It's funny, I was. There seems to be a big trend now of cold plunge. Anyone? You know that. And then the, the sauna. So you do cold plunge. You lost me at cold plunge. So and I'm like, should I stay? Or? It's, but it's like, we think we just made that up. But um, I think that our ancestors, when they had to take a bath, they had to jump in a cold plunge, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they're touting right? all the health benefits the of this. Well, it's why people were, you know, strong then. They did that without the, not having to pay to go to some place that's going to put you in freezing cold water. We just did it. That reminds me of Sorry if that's weird, but that's <laughs> funny story. Nature. Before I got married, I was dating a girl and went to see her mom in California. Yeah. And so as soon as we get there, her mom says, oh, put your swimming suit on and come out in the back. And we're going to take a sauna and then jump in the ice cold pool. And I'm like, okay. So I did that and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I hit that water, I came out of there like a dolphin. <laughs> you know, standing on the side and they were laughing, you know. I thought for sure I was dead. So, you were going to say you were from New Mexico, so you did that, that's, you know, hot no. cold. <laughs> no. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, no, I would say that, um, that the simpler times, like, like we all have childhood memories, right? Um, and I don't know about you, but my most of my childhood memories that are very endearing are of me, like outside, at a river, playing, you know, in in the forest, uh, encountering, you know, animals, things like that. Those are the things that um, resonate with me, um, for sure, and. Yes, the cold plunge thing. Yeah. Lim Hof. Yes. The natural. I tried it. I tried it. Did you, were you like a dolphin too? You know, um, I'll do anything once. I'll say that. You know, um, I like hot showers. Are we still on the shower? Because I like, I, uh, it's just what I do. I, you know, no. Um, <laughs> All right, let's go back to art. <laughs> yes. My bad. And then one time in band camp. No. Um, let's talk about your use of animals in many of your works, right? Um, yeah, I'm a huge out, outdoor guy. Um, I'm always looking for experiences that will put me in the environments where you know there are animals, whatever that may be, hiking, uh, camping, 
And I love that. And then, like this coyote that I captured, yeah, I was actually hiking. I never had my phone on me. I'm kind of like an anti-phone guy. I say never, but this time I did. And I had picked it up. I was checking the time, and I looked up, and that guy was crossing right in front of me, and I was just like, ooh, and I got the perfect shot of him. And I, and I just loved that. And I tried to capture a little bit of the whimsical nature, but also, you know, the stylized idea that it's a wild animal. And of course, I'm a big fan of color. I love to layer color and I love to push, you know, opposing elements that are almost uncomfortable, if you will, but work. And uh, I like that guy. I give him uh, yellow eyes, which I think is pretty cool. And, um, and the bison behind me, I, sometimes I work from photos, sometimes I don't. Um, the majority of the time I don't. But this is also another photo that was shot. My buddy is a uh, wildlife filmmaker. And he captured this bison with the three birds on his back. And I just thought that was just the coolest thing. So I called them uh, storm riders. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of cool. But uh, yes, yeah, cover, of course. That has a little Yellowstone feel for me with the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Like the guys are being... I like that. Um, I like, you know... I, I yeah. do not watch that. It's too, too, too violent. It's I, so. I mean the real part. Yeah, I'm going to say one thing about that. I watched a half an episode and I'm like, is there going to be a helicopter in every scene? That's all I have to say. Anyway, um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, the animal connection too, That's that, that goes back to what we're kind of speaking of is, we all know this, it's common knowledge, but I think it's worth repeating. And that is, back to that connection, you know, we are really removed from how we do certain things. If we want to go and have dinner, then we go to the store, we buy the things that we want to cook, then we go home and we cook it. And I think it's interesting, you know, like the bison, if, you know, if you wanted to go and have dinner, then you had to physically and go and kill an animal, or you had to take, you know, some of your planting. And I like that idea too, because the bison, you know, many tribes followed, they were nomadic, they followed the bison herds around, and they used every piece of the bison. They used everything that could be eaten was consumed. They used the bone for certain things. They used the, the sinew for certain things. They used the, 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 um, the skins. I mean, literally everything on that bison was used. And I think that is, is one of those things that I like to think about. I like to think about that. I'm like, to think, it's, you know, is there a way that, again, can we, can we do things a little differently, and I think that reminder is also something that comes out in art. You're like, hmm, okay. And, and that's what I wanted to do. That's the one thing I learned from from my heritage was I wanted to take, you know, the Sioux would live off the land, use everything up, and then move on. Whether it's a buffalo or whatever, they didn't even live there long enough to destroy the land. I mean, I look living in Colorado, it's like, geez, we don't want the birds raised for breeding, so they're not hunted. Uh, the background you see, it's a textured layered Venetian plaster and how that came about. My dad's a builder in Florida. I had gone in his warehouse after Hurricane Andrew and I saw all this foam where he does synthetic stuff and it's like, what do you do with this? He's like, we're gonna throw it away. And I'm like, no way. So that's how I designed my work. You know, I use that entire warehouse up. So now what I do is I create pieces that we do on a 3D printer and then I wrap them with a fiberglass tape and then I do three layers of plastic with color over that. So that's how I do that. But the whole intent was, from starting out, was to do what my heritage was about, which was use up everything. So that's how it all began for me. Two resources, yeah. And honoring, there, there's a something about the dots and the connectivity. Well, that was the spiritual part of my work. I wanted to bring the energy from my heritage. So when you see my piece, on the mask, every dot that you see on the face is a prayer of thankfulness, gratitude, and abundance. I wanted to bring that because, I, you know, we have so much to be grateful about, and that's that's the one thing I've learned from my heritage is the people, all the stuff they've been through, they're still very grateful for everything, every little day. The triangle of the eye represents unity, the rectangle of the eye, family, and the circle, happiness. So those are little elements I wanted to add back into my work, even with my tokens. You know, the bands are the family. You know, the triangle, unity, 
you know, the half circle families so, and happiness. So I just, I wanted to just keep that flow going, but primitive elements, ancient elements, but more in a modern way. Yeah, that's what, that's what draws me to it, for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, Randy, your pieces, I'm right in front of the TV, but, you know, you, you, you will go to the roundup and take, take photos. Is that what it's called, Roundup? Uh, yeah, Artist Ride is one of them. And then I go up to Montana for the Crow Reservation, for the Crow and the Blackfeet. They have an annual fair there. And then up here, uh, the Navajo Reservation. So a couple of these new ones were uh, Navajo uh, ladies that a friend of mine and I, he's an artist too, we uh, had found a, uh, a photographer up there on the Navajo Reservation and he had a picture of a young girl and we called him and said, hey, what's her name? Do you think she would model for us? And he goes, oh yeah, sure. So then we contacted her and we said, hey, we want to uh, hire some models to model for us would you meet us up at Canyon de Shea and do you have any friends that would like to do this and make a couple hundred dollars? And boom, you know, we had a dozen an email instantly. And so we had five of them and they met us there and everything was fantastic. We spent the whole day, we rented horses and we let them ride up and down the river there at Canyon de Shea. Just spectacular background and, and we shot photos like mad all day and then we said, hey, you want to stay, we'll, if you live around here close, come back tomorrow. If not, we'll rent a motel room for you and you can stay and we'll do it again tomorrow. So a couple of them did and we did it the next day and we ended up with about 4,000 photos and they're all just spectacular. So uh, um, I, I've used a couple of these and the one there, the long skinny one, she was from that and I'm doing a whole series like that that they'll all be the same size and shape. And the cutoff point from where it's a traditional realistic portrait is the necklace, because both the men and the women wore unique necklaces. So I can do the bottom part as just native patterns. So I've worked out a whole bunch of these on the computer and I've got them there and it's just waiting for me to get the work done and get them painted. And then the other girl, this is the brand new one. I was just working on her necklace uh, the one on the horse there riding the big hat. And uh, uh, she was one of the girls that had showed up for the photo shoot. Her name's Haley, and she had just started to do some modeling, and she's just absolutely gorgeous and has hair clear down to her mid-thighs in the back, black hair, just spectacular. So her mom was with her, and it turned out perfect for us because her mom was like the stylist that we didn't have to pay for. She would run in there and go, wait, wait, wait. And she'd straighten up her, and then brush her hair and get her all set. And then go, okay, you can take the picture now. So, so that was great to have her along. And uh, after that, Haley now, this has been a couple of years, is doing all kinds of fashion modeling for uh, Native American production of uh, clothes that they're doing. And because there's a lot of Native American designers now for young people's clothes. So she's modeling for them and getting in catalogs and doing all this stuff, you know. But they all loved doing this. And they all said, we've wanted to do this forever because we just go to high school and everybody's got t-shirts on and wears the same stuff. We have this heritage and tradition that we don't hardly ever get to do if we, unless we go to powwows or something. So we had told them when we called them and said, Ask your mom and your grandmother if you can borrow some traditional outfits and a lot of crushed velvet and different materials. Bring tons of it, everything you can get your hands on, and bring some jewelry. So they ended up, you know, with like a million dollars worth of jewelry from their grandmothers of this all traditional stuff that was spectacular, you know. So we had them changing like every hour. They put on different outfits and get up on the horses and do stuff. And we'd ride up and get up on the cliffs and the rocks and just spectacular things to do. So that's the fun part of the whole thing for me. It's not just the painting. It's getting out and meeting the people. And they'll accept me as an artist because I'm kind of helping out to promote their culture. And then it also brings the young people into it. And then it helps them appreciate it. And then they get 
things in the culture even more. So it's kind of a way of giving back. It's a circle thing. That is a stunning, stunning piece right there. I really like the color. When she picked up that blanket that had the turquoise and put it around her shoulders against that purple, I said, oh, God, that's just beautiful. Because, you know, my whole thing is just the beauty of it all. You know, I'm just in awe when I go to these photo shoots and everything. Um, the outfits that are all handmade, you know, the Native Americans, they were poor, they didn't have much, but everything they had, they made it beautiful. You know, so I always respected that, and it just it just knocks me out every time I see it. You know, I just I have probably nineteen thousand incredible photos now that are just unreal. You know, you look through them for hours and hours and hours. You go, well, what do I take? You know, uh, well, I narrowed it down to about a thousand. So it's uh, it's just been the best part of my life. That's awesome. If we ever can't find Randy, we know he's looking at photos. <laughs> Where is Randy? I've got like 5,000 photos of food. <laughs> so, again, I'm falling short. You're my home, right? But some of the things, um, a lot of times I don't, me personally, working from photos, I love when I have a subject that I'm trying to capture that spirit that like when you take a photo or you have a photo shoot, you're, you're going for a certain film. A lot of times for me, I like to pull things out of my imagination. Sometimes I like to do things that are realistic with uh, you know people with faces. And other times I like to almost create this mask of you know um, shadow, give them a little bit more of a mysterious look. And and I love, you know, I was, people ask, I get asked this a lot like, you know, how do you create these? And I use a palette knife when I paint, so I don't use a brush. And I, I work in layers and I paint flat. And then they go, do you, do you sketch first? And I go, sometimes I sketch first, but a lot of times with my process, I like to kind of take my own journey on these, in these areas. And sometimes I'll get carried away. I've got, uh, you know, some of my friends are like, Ray, there's probably a quicker way to get to where you got to. And I'm like, it's just what I do, you know, 40 layers later. Um, but I like that. And, I always kind of consider myself more of an abstract painter than those figures, because I like that idea of taking something and really like pushing the boundaries of it. And I really appreciate like Randy's work, you know, photorealistic, stylized, very colorful. I love that. And I think you know, mine's kind of a juxtaposition to that, where it's very loose, um, it's idealized to a certain extent, um, and and you know, the story is really what you bring to the piece. You know, like what, you know, what are you feeling that particular day or what does that evoke? And I have a, there's a piece in my uh, booth right now and it's called The Path to the Sun. And it's it's a piece that's uh, a little bit a little bit thinner than this and it has figures. And the figures are taking this journey up to this, this little uh, mountain range. So about four years ago, I had a client commission me to do one of these pieces and I said, great, I did it in yellows. I thought it was really a cool piece, and I delivered the piece, and she's like, oh, thank you, and let me live with it. I'm like, oh, yeah, live with it. And then I I get an email, and she says, Ray, I look at your work, and I feel like I'm in purgatory. I feel so dark. And I'm like, well, clearly that is not your piece. Um, so I went and, you know, I went and took the piece back, and I was like, hey, no problem, not your piece. And ultimately, she did get something she liked. But I had that piece in my gallery. And like a week later, a collector came in, took it home, and I got a text from her, and she said, oh my God, Ray, I look at that piece, and I feel like I am ascending to heaven and the little bright point, and I thought, that's so interesting, you know, and, and, I, and I really think it's that, what do you bring to your piece? So, jokingly, I call that series my purgatory series, um, which is just kind of funny, you know? At the same time. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like that, you know. And I like that too, where, you know, Dutch pieces uh, are similar too. They're they're like a they're like a visual puzzle in a way, which I like. They're interesting, you have different you've got feathers, which is you know, this, this very soft, vibrant um, aesthetic, and then you have this shiny, hard, you know, sharp lines and that again that juxtaposition between the visualization of it, I love Randy, once again, I, I, I got a chance to really take a look at his booth, and um, you know, it's interesting, 
because even though they are, you know, their portraits, they are surreal. I'm not surreal. They are um, realistic. Thank you, thank you, Ray. And um, but but you know, like everyone will look at that and they'll come away with a different idea of what what she's thinking or what's going on in that tent. I know what Doug would say. They'd be drinking in that tent, right? You know, come on. Um, yeah, so I like that. Anyway, um, thoughts, random thoughts. You have the beer. I have the beer, yeah. <laughs> That's what I do. Susan, I, yeah, I, just be quiet. I, don't, I, don't I never see. Anyway, you guys, it's like herding cats. <laughs> so, what I love about all of these is that it really does take you to a place at a time. And we always talk about, um, I love your story about purgatory and heaven because all of us who spend a lot of time here really feel like each work of art is created for one person that it's meant to be. So I love how one person saw darkness and another person, same painting, saw lightness. And it, art is all about how we connect to it. And I think what you you guys are all trying to do is help us connect to some of the beautiful um, earthly gifts that we're given that we learned from the ancestors, but you're doing it in such different ways, but you all convey that feeling of joy and beauty, I think. Yeah, yeah it's hard to, to be this into something, you know, to where um, I feel like I'm living two different lives, you know, and... Uh, you find out all this information and I meet all these people that are, you know, totally different lives in different states and get to be friends with them and I'm totally into it and then I'm chilling at a show or sometimes we do a studio show at my house and people will come in and they go, oh, it's that Indian crap and they leave. And so then I'm like, you know, my brain is spinning like, wait a minute, you know? It just means so much to me. How can somebody else not see any of it? So, you know, to each his own. And I love how your sculptures, too, many of them really tell stories. The one with the Hopi gal sitting on yeah, the ladder. Have, uh, uh, it was from an old black and white photo, and it was just the young girl sitting up on the top of the edge of the adobe building with the ladder uh, around her legs. And so I thought, oh, I could do the whole scene there and do it as a sculpture. And so if you come by my booth, you'll see it. She's cantilevered up on the ladder. I left out the whole side of the building. I just have the roof where she's sitting on their ladder. And then I have the dogs and the chickens running around the bottom because that's what you always see when you go to Indian Reservation. And uh, then I learned about the, the Hopi uh, part of their culture was that the young girls, when they hit puberty until they get married, wear their hair in that special style that's called the squash blossom world and the mothers would do their hair that way and it's to signify that they're available and so i have this young girl sitting up there with her hair like that as you know like a teenager would be sitting alone thinking about her future and so there's like this whole story woven into this one simple little thing with, it's great when you're talking about people talking about you know, oh, this Indian. I love it when someone comes up to me and they go, oh, I just don't like Southwestern. I said, me neither. I can't stand it. <laughs> and I'm like, it's more spiritual. And I go into depth and, and talking about things. And it's like, yeah, it is. You know, I call him. That's my shaman. I never name it more than that. I call the yellow shaman. I have a, you know, I let people decide what it is to them, what they want to name it. I have a client and... Houston, she's got eight of them in this big corner, and she's got plaques, and she's named every piece with a name, and I love that, and that's what I want. It's like, you connect, it's what you feel, you decide if it's male, female, whatever I, you know, I created, it's, it's about you, and, and what you get out of it. So I always try to pull out of that when they say, oh, I don't like self as me neither, hate it. And I just know it's more about a spiritual essence that goes above that. It's, it's taking elements and making it native but modern, but still primitive, so. I don't touch on that. Um, that's one of the strengths of this show, too. 
is that a lot of people, like, you know, let's say if you're online, you're looking at an image, you're kind of seeing literally just the image of that. And then when you get a chance to come here, you have an opportunity to engage the artist. You have an opportunity to kind of get, uh, you know, an idea or the methodology of his or her work. And I, and I, I love that. And last year, a lot, of, a lot of my horse and riders all do... Um, so certain tribes, they would adorn their, their steeds. They would, they would do all kinds of symbols. Some of them would represent, you know, a heightened of the senses or I want hell to fall on my hells and like, you know, ice hell, not H-E-L-L, -L, on my enemies. Or they would put symbols on there to give their mounts uh, like a turbo boost. All kinds of really cool, interesting things. And I take that to a whole other level. I like, again, to kind of push the visualization, the, the boundaries of it. And I had a couple come in and they kind of had a similar thing. They were like, they're like, oh, what's on this horse? Is that is that a horse? You know, I was like, what is that? And I'm like, well, you know, and I and I took that as an opportunity to have a conversation with them. So I, you know, kind of start just kind of educating them, you know, um, and then that conversation went into, okay, well then tell me more about that we were talking about the code track. And so, and I'm not, I don't profess to be an expert on Native American culture by any means. Um, but I happen to have a good friend who's Lakota, and one of the things that he likes to do is he's retired, he's a, he's a famous uh, painter. He likes to hang in my studio and smoke weed. I had to say it, it's true. And, and I don't, so okay. I put him in the corner, and I'm like, and he will regale me with all this really cool mysticism, and I love it, because when I paint, I feel like, you know, I'm visually channeling that from my own mind, and then I'm kind of almost hearing this, like, chant, and it's, it's, it's cool. And so, it gave me an opportunity to really have a conversation with this couple. And so they left, and then they came back. And then we talked about this piece some more. And um, as of this show, I think they brought like four pieces from me. From, from uh, oh my God, you know, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of crap, or whatever whatever their opinion of it is. And I, and I love that. It's like, you know, I'm super ignorant when it comes to sculpture. And um, you know, like Todd Paxson, watching him sculpt, watching my buddy um, Dan Romero, you know, my good friend Dan Romero, um, it's, it's fascinating. You get an opportunity to kind of see their process and have a conversation like with Doug. I love Doug because he has a different approach than I would, you know, um, and I love that. And, you know, what he, what he communicates in his pieces and what I communicate and what Randy does, they're all kind of similar. And it's an opportunity for you guys when you come into our booth to, uh, to glean some information that is, uh, that's golden, you know? Anyway, yeah. Was that like a cat that I, that I do? No, that was, I'm that looking was, for visual cues, really. I'm like, a, okay. That, that was very good, thank you. And, I, and again, I think for me, for most of us, art is about the connection and what resonates with your heart. And I think there's probably no better compliment to an artist than like your lady who said, I love your piece more now than I did even when I bought it. Because the, the message can go, grow, grow deeper as you as you have it and as you learn more about the, you know, the history of it or whatever, but, um... It's true. Um, on, on, that, on that note, like Doug said, that that person had never met him, I usually get the exact opposite. People, when they meet me, they go, never meet your heroes, never meet your heroes, and then they kind of, you know, leave and don't ever come back. That's just me. It's my personality. I'm abrasive. What can I say? And we're still doing karaoke after this, right? <laughs> no? No? Did you all enjoy the free concert? Yeah, Ray, I mean, Ray is also a national. Did you just drop your mic? I did. I did. <laughs> Ray, put it down. He is a national singer songwriter, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, Ray, were you close to the Ruby Mountains when you were in Reno? The Ruby Mountains? No, so the Ruby Mountains are in uh, the Elko. Elko. Actually, my uncle had a cattle ranch. Uh, he had oh, the, the Tippleton gosh. Cattle Ranch, was at the time one of the largest cattle ranches, and I was shipped off uh, in the summer to work there. So, okay, that is so yeah, beautiful. it's beautiful. Yeah. And, so Minden Gardnerville uh, was a really interesting environment because you had the Sierra Nevadas and we were literally in the, um, you know, the kind of the shadow of the mountains. Um, amazing, amazing place. Um, there's something about the desert, you all know because you're here, that it speaks to something that's, that's not tangible, whatever it is. It's, it's the color. It's the feeling, it's the earth, it's the stories that have, that have gone before us. 
And um, wherever I've gone, I was out in Nashville for 20 years. I, I used to be in the country music business. And um, when I had the opportunity to uh, leave Nashville, I did, and I came back to um, the desert. And I've always felt like this is my home. And it's like, but uh, I remember when I, like when you come back to the desert, you just breathe this, breathe this collective sigh, like ah, oh, yeah, this is where, this is where I belong. And I think a lot of people feel that way too. Yeah. Well, as I've said in other um, sessions, I love the color of sky right after sunset here, and this is pretty close to that. Behind me. Yeah. 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 I, can't, I can't turn my head all the way around, but that yeah. just after sunset. Sapphire blue. Yeah, a lot of times Arizona. when you're taking, uh, I would be at the ride and I would be taking night photos around the campfire, and I would set my camera down on a rock or a piece of wood or something, and then hold my breath and hold it for a long exposure to try to, you know, capture some movement in there and see, and it would all turn that sky out. It would be pitch black when you're looking at it, but in the photo it would be that beautiful blue that just turns black. So I did that because a lot of times I stay there in the teepee and you'd see just a gazillion stars when you're out on the prairie. And it was always fascinating to me that the Native Americans had no idea about astronomy or astrology. And, and they believed that the stars, the lights in the sky, were the souls of their ancestors. So I've always thought that's a fascinating thing, way to look at it. So that's what I see when I see the stars now. You know, that there's all your ancestors up there. And so the, the title of that one is Sky of Many Lights. Very nice. Very nice. Um, we've had a few good questions. Or I'd love to see if we have any more questions today. Do you have another one? No, I just want to say we are so fortunate here to be able to see coyotes. I have them in my front yard all yeah. the time. Are worried and scared, but I'm not. Oh, no, we've got lots of coyotes. Yeah, they're keystone species too. Um, they're um, one of the few predators that actually will control roadrunners. And I don't know if you all know about roadrunners, but they're very voracious. They will decimate quail populations. They'll decimate all different kinds of things. And I think that's again that that uh, symbiotic relationship. And a lot of people look at things as like, oh, they're varmints, they're disposable. They're really not. They're, they're not. All this stuff around us is meant to be here. And, it is, and, and again, you've heard it, but it is we who are encroaching on their land and should respect that. And um, I'm a big proponent of, um, you know, letting things be wild and, and letting um, and having a space in our environments and our hearts for animals that, that have just as much right to be here as we do. More right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You wait till the javelinas come in and walk on your pants. I love javelinas. <laughs> I love javelinas. Okay, I, I got a quick javelina story. So, never seen javelinas. First time I come here. Um, it's funny too, however, when I notice when you come to um, Arizona, certain parts of it, when you say things like, you know, fajitas, people will be like, oh man, there's this great restaurant and they have the most amazing fajitas. And I'm like, what? What was that? Same thing with javelinas. They go, oh, the javelinos. And I'm like, what is a javelinos? And it's a javelina. So I did everything they weren't supposed to do. They were rooting around in the garbage. I was like, clearly they need food. Fed them. Were not supposed to do that? <laughs> yeah. Approached them. I was like, These are just like wow, you know, pigs. They're not pigs. They're pickaninnies. They're like a basically large rope. And they smell really, really nice. Yeah. Smell them before you see them. But they're cool. Yeah. And they also will. Uh, you know, they'll make your beautiful flowers and your cactus like a buffet. So that was fun too. So uh, we were like feeding them, you know. But again, I like them because they, they belong here. And they're and it's cool. Like, you know, whenever you see them, you're like, oh, they're javelinas. It's so cool. And I have when friends come and out of town, they always want to see a javelina. So that, that's like a highlight. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to see them. But yeah. yeah. Oh, here's, a, here's a trivia question Does anyone here know what they call a group of javelinas? A troop? A squadron. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. A little trivia. Full squadron of hobbies. So for those of you who don't know, one year we had javelinas run through the tent in the middle of the night. And, in my booth. And they, they got into Randy's drawer and they ate his Fig Newtons. And they said, don't keep food in your drawer. And then 
and then they, want fake news. then they knocked over one of his paintings. I think it was a Giclée, though. Or maybe it was an original. And then they had little Fig Newton footprints. Oh. On the over the back of my thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, Je and Jen yeah. Brains documented most of it. Because she was here and videotaped it. So Let's, let's go back to Havelina's and Randy's drawers. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Do you care to expand, sir? Oh, I do get into nature. Yeah. <laughs> they got into my fix. Yeah. <laughs> I know, fire. Never gonna go there again. Okay, one of you needs to do some Havelina painting, and it's not gonna be Doug. <laughs> you won't do that. Okay, yeah, I'll do a Havelina painting. Yeah, Randy, it was, let's do it. Right? You do like in your drawers, Havelina in your drawers, with like a thing with a fig on the end of it. Maybe it could be the, yeah. a new packaging for a fig Newton. Okay. So, all right, I'm gonna try to bring it back to uh, something. Um, <laughs> Again, with living with art, what I love about all three of you is that we know that your art lives in houses all across the country. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to just be Southwest or Western or, you know, you can, in, you can live in any environment and bring that joy. There's, um, Doug and I were talking about this the other day too. Um, I like data, I like information, and I always want to, I'm curious. Um, where my art finds a home. And so if you were to put a red dot, you have all the usual suspects. You know, uh, you've got them all over Arizona, California, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado especially. And then in New York City, I don't, it's really cool. There's, I've got a handful of collectors that have like um, Arizona rooms, which I love, or desert rooms. And um, I'm always shocked, you know, like, where are we sending this one? You're sending to New York City. I'm like, ah, yeah. And so um, I, think it's, I think that's cool. I think that speaks to, again, what, what we were all talking about earlier is, is that connection. Sometimes I think, you know, when you, when you get a piece that has a, a meaning or reminds you of something, you want to take that with you, right? You, wanna, you want that in your Wisconsin house. You want that in your New York apartment. Um, you want it here, um, or wherever, and I, and I love that, you know, and uh, we all do that, we're all art collectors, uh, I've got some weird art from all over the place, and you know, when you travel, you get something from, and it's like, that means something to you, and um, I love that, I love that idea. Yeah, you agree, Doug? Okay. okay. <laughs> Your work, I think, Doug, I see in contemporary, all the way to traditional. Yeah, uh, I, I, I love that, I, you know, I... It's do installations in Miami and in New York, so it had a crossover. I was fortunate enough in 2022, I did an installation in South Africa and in London. Oh my God. So I was really excited about that. And the one in South Africa is now like, I got like three more commissions because of it. So that's, yeah. like, that's like way cool for me. So I'm excited, that's, grateful. It must feel wonderful. You know, on any given day, I was talking to Todd Paxton one day, and he sits at this table in the center a lot and has his lunch or just sits there or in what he now calls his chair. And I, I'm always like, it must be really exciting without them knowing it and see them connect with your work. And I know that you guys can all experience that. And you know, you almost know right away when it's like they found each other, the art and the person. Yeah, totally. Um... One thing that I noticed, I was doing a, uh, a gallery show, and my neighbor came over and she said, you know, Ray, I pretty much always know when one of your collectors walks in your booth, because they're wearing like the same colored palette as your art. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, and at that very moment, a gal came up and she had like pink shades on, and like turquoise, and I was like, yeah, yeah, maybe you're right, you know? Not always the case, you know? Um, but yeah, it happens, sure. Yeah, opening night, I did have to take a photo of a, yeah. a collector that, like, matched the art. It was fun. Doug's will usually show up with, like, feathers, like a boa. <laughs> yeah. Right? No? We forgot to wear our feathers. Oh, yeah. Yes, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. We actually, we were texting each other, going, what are you going to wear? And I was like, I don't know, I'm going to wear that wolf hat. And he's like, wear that boa. And it didn't work out. We, we totally did not pull it off. Next time. Wardrobe malfunction. So... Do we have any questions from our wonderful... No, but I, I had a thought 
When you mentioned you did an installation in South Africa, what's been going through my mind through all these, oh, sorry. Um, you triggered a thought when I was, uh, when you were talking about your installation in South Africa, and it's been sort of mulling me as you've all talked about your stories and how you appeal to different people and you're kind of carrying forward culture and history and an appreciation for what's gone before in a way that many of us or a lot of people let go of. In fact, it was reviled and dismissed the people and the cultures. And I think um, it was Nelson Mandela that said the way forward after his 22 or some odd years in prison. Um, he studied voraciously while he was there and he said the way forward for this country is through forgiveness, not revenge. And I do think that the way forward, and I think when you say about your installations in London and South Africa, and people who are learning to appreciate um, the culture and the, uh, the animals and the environment, that the way forward is through art. Oh, yeah. I really do believe that. Yeah, it's great. It's very much true. I want to, just one thing on with Nelson Mandela. When I was there, I sat in his cell, oh. on his bed, oh. and I just thought to myself, what did we do here? You know, so, I mean, it was just overwhelming for me to have known everything that I did with that. It was just a moment that I had when you sat. And, and I had the same moment when I was in his cell. Wow. Well, yeah. Okay. I want to touch on, you. that was awesome, by the way. Um, that's a good thought, too. Um, Art is moving forward. Well, well spoken. I want, to, I want to touch on something else, too. Um, when I was thinking about this topic, Randy, Doug, and myself, we all have a connection to the Native American heritage. Um, and I, I'm not, I don't believe that is necessary for an individual to create art. And, and I will try again. I'm trying to hold on. Um, directions to uh, Burger King. <laughs> Possible. No. Um, I don't. I don't think that is a, a prerequisite. Because I have like, um, I, you know, there's there's a ton of artists. When I was a kid, I loved Fritz Shoulder. Um, I loved Ed Mel. I loved, um, you know, Earl Biss. I loved some of those. You know, John Nieto. I had an opportunity to paint with him on several occasions. I got to know him. He was amazing. And then I could also speak with, you know, uh, a ton of other artists that actually create. Um, Southwestern art, Native American art, that um, don't have any claim to heritage, and you know, collectors know, people know when when they approach a piece of art, if it rings with a level of authenticity, and and I'm a believer that um, art is one of those mediums, whether it is written, whether it's visual, whether it is tactile, that you can transcend the boxes that people like to put us in and 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 your talent, your perseverance, your ability will shine through every time. Your 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 ability to visually communicate your authenticity, your love, your respect for that culture. And um, and that is just as important, if not more, than your pedigree. I, I've known a ton of Native American artists that their fathers did it, their mothers did it, and they're just phoning it in. And I'm like, that's that's not what it's about. It's 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 a respect. It's a love for for the the subject, right? It's about your what's in your heart. Your yeah, spirit. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and what you learn from that, it doesn't have anything to do with anything else but what you hold in here. I, I, I get to ask, ask that a lot. I don't go into my lineage. They go, um, are you Native American? And, and my response is like, why did you ask that question? Just curious. And people say, well. I want to know. And I'm like, do you like my art? Do you, does that move you? And some people will say, not really. And I'm like, okay. Okay. I don't have to answer that question. It doesn't matter. And some people say, yeah, I do love it. And I'm like, great. What, what do you love about it? And they'll say, well, you know, I love the colors. I love the texture. And then we start talking about it. And then pretty soon we're not even having a conversation about where you came from or who you are. And I like that idea. I think that idea in art in particular is is the way forward, right? Love. You know, um, should should you should you be put into a a box for lack of a better word, you know, um, or are you able to, you know, let your talent persevere, let your hard work, let your your love, your passion. And um, 
Yeah, so I think that's important to um, identify. And, and it shows. I mean, you really do capture the spirit of all of that in your work. I mean, it, it's it's amazing. Yeah. You, you need to do, yeah. And, oh, beautiful. Thank you all. Appreciate that. It means a lot. Amen to that, yeah. And and we have many other amazing painters, artists in this tent, right? That Marty LeMessure being one that, you know. Mm-hmm. Let's give a shout out to Marty. Marty. Gives great. How are you? She tolerates me probably more so than anyone else, so we love her for that. Um, but every, every painting that Marty does gives such honor to the Native culture and the beauty, and she's working on one right now that's a collection of Native American pins. Just, it's going to be fabulous, but I think, in a nutshell, the artists who are here are living their passion and nobody's phoning it in. You know, they're 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 conveying the beauty of whether it's the culture or texture or you know what whatever the subject matter, that's what's coming through. And I think that's why so many people really connect so deeply here and you know why you guys all do so well is you are living that like that whole lifestyle and Again, you know, Marty's Marty's one of the the best I know. Thirty three years in this in this tent. Yeah. Um, woohoo! You, you know, Marty really captures it. It, it. it reminds me of like being on the reservation, looking at all the the pieces. My grandmother, she was a dancer, and I mean, her work is so unbelievable as far as what you see. It it, it brings me back to all those childhood memories of being on the res and what I was fortunate enough to see. And no, they're not real beads, they're paint, and do not touch them. <laughs> yeah, they so like, the very, size, very wet paint, do not touch. Yeah, but I mean, layers and layers and layers of, of paint to build up that texture that looks like a, literally a, a beaded bag or moccasins hanging right there in front of you. So, so amazing. So. Well, yeah, Todd Paxton. Oh. So I was thrilled because my father uh, was born in Valentine, Nebraska, right 10 miles from the Sioux River Rosebud Reservation. So his childhood story is what she told me. I mean, his childhood actions. He said, the Navajos came to my village and held my hand on me, learned how they danced in the circle, and they taught me wazi topa on me hope. And then, that's interesting. That's my opinion. And then, uh, don't criticize me, I'm just learning. And then his gift to me, uh, the most important thing in his life, which I inherited, were three pairs of moccasins, and then I brought them here, I guess, and painted them. And then my family, of course, gets to have them behind glass. I said, don't let them dry out. In the <laughs> but, uh, so, so, but I was taught, you know, all the... God's people are his beloved creation, and so I never, I, I never had any, I've never had any, like, some of them speaking about, like, I don't, I, I just love them, and they have beautiful colored skin, and they're just, I just love them. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your moccasin story. We just saw you with Doug's mom. What's your name? I have those moccasins now. Yes. Thank you. I want to see them. Yes. Of course Susan's mom. Okay. That's, but she's, I was introduced as Dutch mom, so she's forever be Dutch mom. <laughs> okay. Hey. I know. Uh, I think we're out of time. But you guys, thank you so much. I hope that you just feel the depth of their love for what they do. And um, again, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Randy Galloway's studio is on the North Ten, about two thirds down in, I don't know what aisle. What's your number? 144. Uh, Tigerman's right down here. Yep, you come out here and hang a left and you'll see um, my booth right there. And then Doug is a little bit farther to the left. Yep. Right kind of uh, so in proximity. Right. Yeah, come check us out. Come Thank you out. so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.